Thank you for joining us on another episode of the Uncivilized Podcast. I'm Brady, joined as always by Artemis and as well today by Emmanuel. We also have a special guest here with us, John Zerzan. You all know who he is, uh, but we just want to get a little bit more in depth with him and I'll let Art start it off. Yeah, so John Zerzan, anarcho-primitivist. At one point, everyone knew him as like friend of John Kaczynski, but I think everyone at least that follows this platform knows that John's a little bit more than just a couple of labels thrown onto him. So John, first of all, thank you for coming on and dealing with all the tech issues that ensued just prior. Oh, thank you. Thanks for your patience. Yeah. So we got to say ever since this show started something like four year, four, almost five years ago now, people have been asking, well, when's John going to come on? When's Zerzan getting on? And it's, well, it's, it's happened. And we want to say thank you for doing so. My pleasure. Yeah, it is, it is a great honor for us to talk to you as um, as young people and as anarchists who have been reading your works for, for me, about five years now. I know Art has been interacting with things that you've written for longer than I have. He, uh, Art is actually the one who introduced me to things that you've written. So yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Good deal. Good to be with you guys. Thank you. And um, I just wanted to start it out pretty simple. Who is John Zerzan, and what brought you to radical politics? Well, um, basically a writer, and I've been around so long that, uh, you know, you can have a long odyssey if you're given the time to, you know, to embark on it. And of course, I came of age in the 60s, so that was, it continues to be a, uh, a force, I guess you might say, in my life, in my uh, outlook, and that my union experience was formative uh at that time as well it was uh you know this do-it-yourself uh anarchist small a anarchist uh union of white collar workers in san francisco that was cooked up at the time and uh was very uh much a learning uh, experience uh anti-authoritarian uh experience and well i left that i was in the Department of Social Services, city and county of San Francisco for almost five years. And after that, <clears throat> I more or less started in grad school and my interest was unionism, the history of unionism, the role of unionism as a kind of carceral institution, disciplinary institution in the kind of Foucaultian sense. And, uh, and that's what led right into the question of technology, actually, in terms of the earliest uh, factories, you know, the Industrial Revolution, the textile industry basically in England and the labor struggles there or the struggle to proletarianize people into the factories. And Marx said it's so completely wrong. That doesn't radicalize people, that domesticates people. That was the meaning of it. And so, you know, then if you, it seems to me, <clears throat> this is something I disagreed with Kaczynski about, if you pull the thread of technology as a social question, you get to the question of civilization. You get to see, well, things like what is domestication? Where does it come from? Um, and, you know, then slowly, you know, you can have a critique of industrialism, industrial society, uh, you know, all of that historically available, you know, and, and uh, anyway, just over the years, I guess kind of deepened into the, uh, moved over into the question of civilization, what's its basis, you know, what drives it, what is it fundamentally, and uh, where is it going, you know, so that's, I've been able to work on questions like that over the years. Yeah, yeah, and I know for me specifically, and I believe that Art and Emmanuel both have the same experience. Um, was that your work specifically, obviously reading things like Industrial Society and its future, brought me away from my social anarchist beliefs being an anarcho-communist uh, towards being more of an eco-focused anarchist. And now I just call myself a small a anarchist. Um, what brought you specifically away from leftist tendencies and radical politics to your more civilization-focused um, anarchist beliefs? Well, you know, early on, I just from my direct experience, the left was not helpful. You know, it's funny, the leftist groups in San Francisco and the Bay Area were, and the unions, were at least as hostile to us, this uh, 
this do-it-yourself union, which had a very uh, unradical name, Social Service Employees Union, SSEU, not, not any kind of uh, radical moniker, but that, they, were, uh, they were always opposed to independent action they were always opposed to autonomy and uh, they wanted to massify everything and, you know, uh, to the proletarian uh, collective. And, uh, you know, that, that was, I was originally, very originally in San Francisco days in the 60s, a Maoist because they were very militant. They just jump off into the street and start fighting with the cops. And that's, I was, very angry and militant and so forth, and I gravitated to that. But very quickly, I began to see that, you know, in practice, it was very conservative. It was not adventurous or militant, really. It just wanted to round everybody up and have them sign a contract, and there they are locked into the unions, and seemingly without any understanding of what unionism began as or functions as, not even understanding that locals of any union are the property of the international. I mean, basic definitions like that, they don't seem to, so they waste their time with these kind of shadow battles of locals of whatever union it is trying to uh, break out of that, not realizing that, again, the, the, uh, the local is the property of the international, the property of the headquarters, the, the union. So you know, basic stuff like that was uh, <clears throat> fundamentally against any kind of breakout. And uh, they never got that. So I was anti-left from the get-go in, in a sense. Not that that was any thorough analysis or complete analysis, but I had to cope with that <clears throat> all the time as a union organizer for this uh, kind of crazy anarchist union. And we were trying to set fires, so to speak, every day make trouble every day and try to destabilize the whole system from within. That was our point of view. Absolutely. And I mean, that is actually kind of interesting to hear because um, for me, starting out in radical politics around the 2016 election, I had just turned 18 years old. Um, I was very active in the political scene in Minneapolis. And I started out with the uh, many groups that were aligned with the IWW. And it was the same thing that I started to notice that during the time when the police would show up and try to disrupt our organizing. Um, for me, it was noticing that the people aligned with the IWW waving red banners were very passive. And I would see kids my age showing up waving these black and red flags, never having seen one before, and solid black flags. And I would ask them, who are you? Uh, these kids were always the ones who were out at the front. They were uh, fighting with the cops. They were fighting with fascists in the street. And when they told me they were anarchists, I really didn't know much about it. But from those days on, it, it definitely hooked me. Um, so, yeah, I'm, thank you for explaining your perspective. Yeah, that's, uh, that's very, very similar. You know, in the 60s, I was very, very dimly aware of the anarchist thing. I mean, it didn't come from reading Bakunin or whatever, but I was I was looking for it. And the closest thing I found was the Wobblies. And like you just said, very passive. The 60s passed them by. They were doing their, their little uh, archaic union thing. And that was it. I mean, they weren't involved in anything except that. You know, they, they had their syndicalist hobby. Such a throwback. At, you know, <laughs> But I thought, well, maybe that's the, a source of radical stuff, authentic stuff. But it wasn't. That's not where it was. In fact, that's the funny thing about the 60s. It was so overrun by different kinds of Marxist-Leninists, mainly Maoists. Uh, it's a wonder anything got done in, in terms of fighting with, with a rigid, <laughs> stupid ideology like that. It's, it's almost as if everybody was sort of an anarchist, but nobody used that term. And, and everybody, most cutting-edge radicals anyway, were, were very much... Uh, in, in in those sets, one way or another, you know, that's that's who called the tunes. And uh, so despite that, there was, there was a lot of you know, a lot of breakout stuff. You know, there were all kinds of struggles all over the place. So, uh, you know, in many ways. Absolutely. And I think, um, Emmanuel, you had a question, right? Yeah. Going off <clears throat> what we were just saying, do you think that there's any use today in today's world for uh, participating 
allying with or advocating for these sort of traditionally leftist structures? Or do you feel that they're just complete impediments and misuses of anti-civilization well, energy? You know, that can get tricky. I, I don't have any hesitation, uh, What I would say, exposing or denouncing that uh, framework or that orientation. But, uh, well, let me put it this way. There's a struggle one block from where I'm sitting here, uh, just around the corner from our place, uh, an eviction struggle. The tons of cops showed up Wednesday, July 5th. A uh, black family was being evicted, and there were a lot of young uh, militants trying to block the way, and it was pretty hairy for a while. I mean, a bunch of armed pigs, and there was nobody got arrested actually, and there was just a little bit of pushing and shoving. But you know, that's they then they withdrew, having. Uh, erected fences around this little house, which was the eviction site. And uh, what I'm getting at is the main orientation of these kids who look like anarchists to me, communists. I mean, that just blows my mind. That's so ridiculous and offensive to me. And yet there they were. And they know who I am. They're they're very friendly to me, uh, mostly. Although I stopped by, like I guess it was last night or the night before, and uh, this one guy, the first thing he said was, I'm a communist. So I, I just ignored him. And I, I, I was chatting <laughs> with some other people. Well, one guy anyway. I mean, others wanted to, you know, chat with me and stuff. And it was they're very nice young folks. But I still can't, as much as I support that struggle, and I do all the way, in more ways than one, actually. but. Uh, communist are you fucking joking i mean you know it's but it's not the main thing I mean, and that's another large question for us i think you know what is going on something brewing well what flavor is it or what what the hell does it does it sound like these days and i think what i'm getting is uh and i don't have any scientific uh report on this i don't even do social media so I, I know various people in various places but i i could be wrong and that is ap anarcho primitivism green anarchy that's whatever you want to call it that's what's going on and that's what's catching on and we'll see you know but the block from here <laughs> it's kind of not that going on it's just some uh, strange uh, thing that you know should have been buried how many decades ago I think there's definitely a lot of people out there that have uh, great intentions and want to, to exercise their their power to change the world, and they might not have they might not have yet uh, encountered. What I mean to say is that they're they're stuck in these old leftist structures, and they don't realize yet that they're able to to do these things and be even more effective when they're not bound by those by those structures and rules. No, I think you're right. That's well put. I'd say uh, there there's a good radical energy. And, uh, but, you know, and people, maybe you're implying this uh, as well, people go through different changes. I did. You know, if I was originally some kind of Maoist in the 60s, uh, that didn't last long, you know, and I was uh, pretty turned on by that initially, like I said, but, you know, you can uh, live and learn. Yeah. Uh, you mentioning kind of like the, you said, you know, AP, green anarchy, and this has been on my mind a little bit, is I would say anti-civilization, you know, it really grew and we're going to get to it during the time of the green anarchy magazine. And I think we probably all agree really went into a rut for some, some time period, particularly before our, our radicalization in just before the, the years of 2020, right? 2016 ish time. Um, but I would say it's kind of growing back and it's, it's flourishing in different ways. Because now you have people that say, oh, I'm anti-civilization, but they don't mean anarcho-primitivist, which is really interesting. The anti-civ milieu has diversified. Um, and it leads to really weird arguments, I think. Like, you'll have, like, egoists and nihilists, right? Like, the war zone people who are anti-civ, but they're not primitivist. Or I would get, say like, I even fit under that umbrella as well. Yeah. like Or you have, like, post-civilization. But there's also a move from people to be like, well, and, you know... Primitivism is not really anarchism because X, Y, Z, usually, oh, well, it's ableist, uh, it's authoritarian, it's racist. How do you respond to those things? And do you think the differences between all these different anti-civ ideas are actually meaningful? 
Like, what is your what is your take on kind of the development of anti civ in recent years? Well, you're right to say there's all kinds of variations. You know, <clears throat> for example, Wolfie Landstriker comes to mind as I would say he's yep. anti civ light because he doesn't want to get into one thing that uh, I guess I'd say maybe people closest to my uh, tangent have been uh, inspired by, and that is the record, the anthropological record, you know, the long yeah. story of uh, hunter-gatherer band society life and how uh, significant that was. That changed my thinking. When I discovered that stuff in the 80s, it changed my, my whole thinking, particularly. But if mm -hmm. you, and some people would even say that's ideological in the sense of that's a rigid thing, you're totally dependent on on the anthropological, archaeological literature. I don't think it is, because I think you'd have the same, maybe the same telos, the same goal, even if that didn't exist. For example, face-to-face -face community, real, uh, direct, um, unmediated uh, world, you know, a completely decentralized uh, kind of setup. I mean, it, that's, whether or not you know anything about uh, the anthropology, if that's what you want, who cares about the anthropology? You know what I mean? Even though it is there uh, as a touchstone for many yeah. of us, you know, the actual stuff, the actual existence of that and how it operated and what it, what it uh, implies, you know, for the future. Yeah. And I, f I find it interesting too is, well, you know, they always say, well, you all, you just want to go back to something and it's gone, right? That's gone. Or, it, or even the taste that, oh, it's not, it was never a thing. Right. But what's funny is even your, your work, future primitive, you're not saying we're going back to anything. It's, you know, it's, it's also just discarding this whole idea of forward and backward. Right. I think it's in your, your notes from the age of pandemics. You even say we need to get off this, tra this train of history or something to that regard. I think you're quoting Walter Benjamin, if yeah. I remember correctly. Um, yeah, so like this idea that we're going back to anything just doesn't line up with in a, what primitivism really is about. Uh, so I wanted to ask in relation to my last question, do you have sympathies for non-primitivist projects or energies that are existing now? Do any come to mind? Because I know on your show, Anarchy Radio, you talk about the Greek anarchists quite a bit and what's going on in, Zar in Arzarchia, even if they're not explicitly primitivist. Are there other anarchist energies you're sympathetic to? Well, yeah, I mean, generally, all those struggles, all that, uh, the attacks on the system. I mean, uh, and when I was in, I was only there once, but uh, at Exarchia, we didn't have any clashes about ideas. I mean, they they were fine. They weren't, they did not put much stress on it. But uh, yeah, that's that's good stuff. I mean, they, they were, uh, they were down. I mean, and I, but yeah, I, I, I don't think even now they, uh, you know, identify in that way. I mean, they wouldn't, they wouldn't use that language for one thing, but yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It's uh, otherwise you're, you're not a part of anything, you know, if you're not aware of what's going on and trying to strike a blow in whatever way you have, uh, you know, it's got to include that. It kind of reminds me of uh, people who used to say, I don't know, maybe sometimes they still do say, well, how come you never talk about capitalism, you know? Well, it's it's understood, it's implied. Of course we're anti-capitalist, but that's just for starters, you know, that doesn't, of course. you know, if you've got nothing much new to add to the critique of capitalism, well, why why stick there, you know? If, because it's, a, well, basically it's a deeper problem than that, uh, fundamentally, so, mm -hmm. you know. But yeah, I, I love to, uh, I have, not doing that much these days, nor is anyone else, but, you know, actually speaking in public, meeting people and going places, uh, a lot less of that right now for various reasons, but uh, I always really enjoyed the hell out of that. Mm -hmm. I would add on uh, to what Zerzan was saying about anti-capitalism that to me, in my own personal discovery throughout the course of my life, that anti-civilization is just Anti -cap my anti-capitalist urges like um, applied at a at a deeper level because I yeah. feel like when I was very young I didn't even have the the language to articulate to articulate uh, what it's like to exist in this world 
and I ran into leftism because that was a, a more crude expression, I would say. And then when I became familiar with that, I discovered its shortfallings. And then from there, that's how I reached anti-civilization. Oh, yeah. Well, we're hugely different in age, but it's the same deal. <laughs> you know, I, I couldn't, couldn't put it better. I find it interesting that like, I mean, leftism on purpose has set itself up as like, we are the radical solution whatever subset of leftism, like, you know, whether it was Maoism in the 60s or democratic socialism now or whatever it is, they're like, well, we're the radical ones. Anyone that's not us, they're the reactionaries, right? So they're excluding any other possible route of liberation. If you're not a leftist, you're basically the right. Because I think all of us have gotten this. And it's like when you're like, oh, I'm not, I'm not left. They're like, are you right wing? It's like, no. It's like, so you're like a fascist. You're like, where are you? Where are you getting that? I'm not quite sure where you're putting those together from. You know, because they can't. They literally can't conceive of of an of a tendency or a thought pattern outside of what's been prescribed and laid down for them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just as you say, it's it's a pretty much automatic first line. Well, then then you're on the right, of course. Oh, I mean, that's just so silly. Kind of on the the vein of talking about if you have um, any sort of support for non primitivist projects, have you heard of by any chance um, more militant eco anarchist groups like Eco Platform in Ukraine or other groups inside of uh, northern Syria and Iraq? Uh, what are your opinions on on those groups? Uh, I'm not very well informed on that. What what I have found out is is kind of dated, I think, in terms of stuff like that. Okay, no, that's totally understandable. There's not a whole lot to uh, to read on them. Uh, we've been trying to get them on, but obviously, Eco Platform in Ukraine is dealing with a little bit bigger or more pressing of an issue than talking to us. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they're they're an explicitly. Uh, uh, green anarchists, they kind of seem to have like a some blend. You know, they're obviously they're going through some, so they don't have the best ability to explicitly elucidate an ideology, but they're kind of somewhere between like social ecologist and anti civilization. They're also vegan or like animal rights. It's hard to tell because some of their stuff is obviously in Ukrainian, and when you translate it, you're only getting whatever Instagram or whatever platform tries to translate it as. But yeah, there is like these people, they fly the green anarchist flag and they're involved in the Ukrainian struggle. It's actually really intense to think about. Yeah, you can find all kinds of uh, combinations. I mean, the thing in Turkey still blows me away. The, the uh, When Okala from prison changed the party line uh, to Bukhanism, I mean, mm-hmm. <laughs> I was uh, in Istanbul just kind of right after that, that sort of switcheroo happened and... Uh, these kids were saying, oh, yeah, now it's uh, books and thought, you know, with, on the banners of the marches and stuff like that. And, and I thought, sure, they were kidding me. <laughs> they are just jiving me. And, and they showed me the footage. I mean, and then I found out, no, that's, that was exactly what happened. He just uh, changed his thinking. And, you know, by the way, they would have hung him years ago, except they were, Turkey was trying to get into NATO. I think that's the reason why he was still alive, or well, still is alive. But... I mean, who would have guessed that from this rigid Marxist-Leninist uh, weirdness to uh, social ecology? I mean, not that I, I have a big critique of social ecology, you know, as you may know, but still, <laughs> that's kind of amazing shift. It's a right. step in, in the right direction, for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a, yeah. We know that you have written about the topic of hope before, of hope versus despair. Um, we were wondering how people should engage with what is commonly referred to as climate anxiety, or as Artemis prefers to call it, climate angst. This impending feeling of wrongness when it comes to the environment, because everyone can see to some degree, regardless of the many distractions that are present in modern society, there's a very particular negative feeling when you see things that are terribly out of shape in the environment, things that have been cornerstones of human psychology for hundreds of thousands of years and that has a certain effect on people we believe when it comes undone do you have any uh beliefs on how this how these emotions can um be addressed or how they can be used for good well it's it would be hard to believe that there wouldn't be this kind of disquiet whatever you want to call it i mean it's things are going 
things are turning out so horribly so fast and it's just an ever faster clip and not only the environments it's the the rate of mass shootings you know that brings it home perhaps even closer what's happening in society you know the physical environment uh, aside if as if you can separate them and you can't i don't think but you know there's every reason to be you know getting more shook up all the time by how fast it's going and i guess and obviously the technology which is deforming everything uh you know being so decisive so fast with the whole chatbot ai you know machine generated thinking so called and all that coming on in a hell of a rush and right not in the past week you can't i mean heat heat alone global overheating is just galloping all these things are accelerating so i mean who could how could you find somebody who's not uh, aware on some level of maybe the totality of all this shit that's going down and the, which is nothing but the pathological uh, end zone of uh, civilization it's all crumbling it's all failing what part of it is there to miss mm -hmm. i mean you know tell me what part is stable or much less healthy you know so of course it, it just jams on people uh all the time and that you know and i think the only you know the necessary first step is to understand how that happens why that happens you know what's behind it then then you feel perhaps less anxiety in the sense of not having a place to put that you know not having oh well, not having the understanding of it you got to start with that you, do you know what's going on yeah do you know why you know shit like that that's the basic stuff and if you can if you can get somewhere there i think that that's an antidote to anxiety at least it doesn't chase away the reality obviously not but i mean at least then you have a fix on it you kind of you're not just bewildered by the complete mm -hmm. uh you know feeling powerlessness or something like that if you can name it and understand it then you can take up arms against it. This is something it, sort of in relation to the climate anxiety um, topic. At least for us at Uncivilized, we spend a lot of time dealing with so-called uh, eco-fascists or other far-right groups who claim to advocate for anti-civilization, sometimes even primitivist ideas, while being far-right individuals themselves. Um, how, how do you think that that has tended to arise out of things like climate anxiety uh, how does that make you feel to know that something some ideology like that is becoming far more prevalent today um, because of climate change and industrialism and industrial society well the opportunism there is is obvious and it's i think it's fairly simple to disentangle that you know that game that they're playing uh you know, yeah, all these far right people are all uh, quoting Kaczynski and so forth. But you know, that's that's an obvious game. I mean, that's just such a it's a pathetic effort. And uh, I mean, I don't know how far it's going, and so I could be misgaging that. But you know, again, it's it's kind of simple to point out the the absurdity of that. You know, just that. I mean, so this ideology means what? You know, so how can you tack that on to this kind of authoritarian crap that you're trying to peddle? You know, what does it have to do with your racism and, and all the rest of it? It's just a bad fit. And people, you got to figure, given a chance, they'll see right through that kind of baloney. Yeah. I mean, the the part two is like, they don't see how their conception of whiteness and like control and race is entirely a mm -hmm. product of civilization. Like they just cannot conceive of the fact that they're walking contradictions. And we've had people er early on when we were still, we were branded as critical of capital before we became uncivilized. We had fascists follow us and be like, you know, we're like with you guys, right? And all this, and we've done episodes before in our social media, we are like, we're not with you. Like I'm trans, right? I'm Like we're openly like, we're just not with you. And they just can't get it through their thick fucking skulls. That they just, they're, they're idiots, and it's insane to me that yeah. they, you know. And uh, one thing I want to add on as well is just as, as early as last week, we were asking our community fielding questions 
And we had uh, a couple of far, these far right individuals that we've been dealing with for years say something as silly as to be uncivilized is to understand the Jewish agenda. And it, it, we've spent so much time talking to these people that I could turn blue in the face. But, um, and I know a lot of them are listening now. So if you have anything you'd like to say to them specifically, please feel free to. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It, and it goes back a ways. I remember I got a letter from Timothy McBay before they executed him, of course, uh, saying uh, that same thing. Hey, we're in the same camp. We got the same enemy. You know, we we're we're actually comrades. You know, I didn't bother to reply, but and you know they want to believe that they want to have allies. You know, they're they're trying to have their uh, racket uh, go further. And uh, how do we reach people? Well, we, you know, and of course in Nazi Germany they did that. They, they Dare and the other uh, green characters, they were peddling that, and they made some headway with that. You know. It's, dropped it of course because uh, it was there was no basis for it but and you know my cousin and i when we we were doing a kind of speaking tour in oh it was more than 10 years ago but i'll tell you the first question the very first twice at least twice this happened anyway in uh, austria and germany we we do our rap and they'd say the nazis said that <laughs> wow. I mean, that's so goddamn infuriating. You know, you haven't learned anything in almost a century. I mean, to, to fall for that, like, oh, yeah, well, that's right. We're a bunch of American Nazis. Yeah, we're, we're here to uh, tell you the same thing that the Nazis said. I mean, it's just so brainless that you, you don't even know where to start. I mean, it, it was so frustrating. But, you know, if you take a few seconds, well, you can just demolish that or, you know, deconstruct that in, in a few seconds and point out how, how stupid that remark is. But that's what they would start up with, because that's, that's, they'd heard it before. No, absolutely. Yeah. And I'll say that's one of the things that when we started this project, when we um, started becoming more critical of technology and civilization and all the like, it was one of the most frustrating things for me speaking with people who used to listen to our show when we were overtly leftist and um, listening to their conversations and seeing their conversations about us after our transition. Um, I remember we were talking one day about how we, we made this post to try to differentiate ourselves from the, the far right people who were starting to come into our community and filter through talking about how we were eco militants against fascism and the amount of right wingers and the amount of left wingers both arguing that you cannot be an eco militant and be against fascism was kind of mind boggling to me how they, they both had the same exact position and could both be so wrong in the exact same way. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, yeah. I see. <laughs> Jeez. Well, you know, again, for starters, sometimes, you know, it can be frustrating to hear the same uh, wrong headed stuff. But it's to me. I've one of my things I try to remember is that's only for starters. That may be the first line, and of course you're saying you. you some people just stick with it no matter what you say, but a lot of people I think I have this feeling anyway, from my limited experience, you can get past that fairly quickly with some people who are not you know rigid ideologues who are never gonna uh, or not likely to to wake up, but. You know, then you answer, uh, you know, uh, in a friendly way, and that's that's it. Then you move on. Then you're past that. Mm -hmm. I gotta say, you're a lot more patient than we are. I did, maybe it's because you got the experience, but we get really pissed if we fucking quit. We just get so I, tired. I have it. no patience for people anymore. My brain has been ruined. Uh, I can't do it. Oh, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Yeah, it can be. I'm just a very angry person, and the world has made me this way. <laughs> yeah, damn right. Uh, yeah, I think too. It's it's just interesting that you know people will say like now like primitivists are called eco fascists, and what I find imp important and you'll know who some of I, everyone here is going to know who I'm talking about. But Jamie, the anthropologist that lives in Alaska, him and I have been talking a little bit. And what I find interesting is the more that other anarchists want to exclude us from anarchism and from the rat from the green movement whatever you want to call it you they realize they're actually sitting ground to the eco-fascists who are going to monopolize in those spaces because as fascists do and they did this in nazi germany they did it in italy 
they they take real problems that people have and they twist it right oh you're poor our country's in shambles it's but it's not because oh here's the actual structural issues right oh it's the jewish agenda it's the decadent west it's queer people you know what yeah. i mean and with environmentalism the more you dissuade people from what is the i mean we all believe it so like the the correct idea that civilization is the problem if you remove us our platform you try to get rid of us and say we're fascists that only gives the fascists themselves more ammo so they're actually doing the 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 grunt work for the eco-fascists themselves when they try to exclude us and that's the ironic yeah part. yeah good point communists have never cleared the way for fascists before have they never i don't think that's ever happened <laughs> that could happen right <laughs> And so I guess I want to get a little, kind of get back to your history a little bit. And, you know, my zine, Plastic and Utero, just came out heavily inspired by the Green Anarchy magazine. I was hoping maybe you could talk about, because I think most people are going to know what it is, but could you talk about how that came about? Because if I remember, the, it was called the Green Anarchy Collective, the core group of editors. And I have some uh, furious questions about Green Anarchy, but that's my first one is, what was the background and how did it come together? Well, this... Uh somewhat mysterious anarchist upsurge uh, started in here, anyway, and this was a, kind of a hotbed of it, I guess, Eugene, Oregon. Uh, it just kind of came out of nowhere, you know, really. That's, people are still scratching their heads. Where did it come from? And then where did the zines come from, I guess, is, the, is part of the question. But uh, in June of 1999, six months before WTO in Seattle, there was a standard issue demo. Uh, some of you know this, I won't take forever with it, but it was a time when uh, things were starting to cook up in various places. In fact, it was announced during this demo, which I didn't attend, I thought it was just one more boring demo, that anarchists had broken into the London Stock Exchange. Anyway, a cheer went up, as I found out later, and uh, the, the guy in charge, who was kind of a slimy character, said, well, this has been a wonderful demo. See you next time, you know, kind of break up, you know, go home kind of thing. Well, instead, people went to the nearest bank about a half a block away and started breaking the windows. <laughs> what? And the riot went on for four hours. And the cops at one or two times, one or two parts of the afternoon, were chased out under a hail of rocks. It was amazing. The pigs were on the run. It was really a day out of nowhere. Absolutely no one thought that was going to happen or plan that or anything like it. I was having coffee with my daughter and I smelled the tear gas and I heard a racket in the background and I got on my bike and there it was. This roving uh, group went from downtown back to the Whitaker neighborhood here. Anyway, that's and at that time, these these smaller zines started up like Black Clad Messenger was one. I love that name, Black Clad Messenger. Uh, one was disorderly conduct started up the main guy who was doing that had been busted for disorderly conduct like five times already <laughs> he was a real black black guy I mean, he was he was ready to you know get out there in the streets and so anyway that's uh these things kind of coalesced into a you know sort of bigger project ga which went from 2000 to 2008 and petered out like Things did, you know, the, you know, things started to slow down and uh, disappear. And in Eugene, you know, after Seattle, which again, six months later, uh, and there were a number of uh, anarcho liberals up there who were afraid that the Eugene anarchists were going to show up and <laughs> fuck things up. And you might say that's exactly what happened. <laughs> anyway, uh, so, but, you know, it ran its course. We had a core group of four editors uh, all the way through. Well, at times there were more editors than that, but uh, by 2008, most people have left Eugene because of the heat uh, and, and just because of the entropy. You know, the, that time was past. It, it ran its course and uh, things slowed down all over the world, you know, uh, in Europe mm -hmm. anyway as well. So that was the end of it. Can I ask, why did you, when everyone else moved, why did you stay? Well, you know, I've been here a while. I moved back to Oregon in the early 80s, so I've, I've been here. And uh, I was part of the East Blair Housing Co-op, and that was a very interesting uh, 15 years of my life. I was part of that. 
um, you know, so I had a, and I lived in the Whitaker, and you know, that was where I wanted to be. I wasn't going to move back to California. And, you know, I was born in Oregon. I was born up in Salem. So, you know, some people, this, what happened in Eugene wasn't that people came from all corners and just to jump into things in Eugene, a lot of people were local, but some weren't, you know, so they went back to wherever they were from. I remember a friend from Denver, he, he just split and went back to Denver or wherever, you know. But So there was some of that. They, they weren't really, uh, you know, what you'd call residents, I guess. They were for a while, you know, for sure. And they were there for the most interesting part of it to, from, uh, from eight, from 98 to nine, 98, 99 to, uh, up until nine eleven two thousand one. 2001. Mm-hmm. So did, was there just a convergence of, you said the core, the core for editors, was it just a convergence of this energy or were you, I'm curious, did you all develop and then arrive at the same idea or were you guys co mingling and the ideas developing within that group and the green energy came out of that? Cause I know there's also like, I don't know, uh some hearsay about like what was it the dude that ran green anarchist in the uk got mad because he thought you guys took it or something like that i forget what the controversy of that is well no i it as far as i remember the uh the only issue one of the uk green anarchist people had started uh green anarchy magazine ga had actually started it from a grant from uh earth first and he was he was much more of a leftist than the other UK GA people were. And um, mm. he he did, I think, two or three issues. This was not the GA we're talking about. This is in the 80s. Oh, okay. And uh, he saw it being taken over by, <laughs> by the primitivists, you know, by the Green Anarchy people, you know. And the four of us that ended up as the last editors were – Pretty much there from the beginning and when he gave it up mm. i remember uh rotten said to him in no uncertain terms you know what we're going to do with this magazine don't you it, it ain't going to be nothing like your orientation you got that so don't hand it over with uh, to come back and say you were kicked out or you were t- tricked or whatever no but that's what he that's what he tried to pull though uh toward the end of the run of, of our GA. Oh, you, you people, you kicked mm-hmm. me out. You, you, it, was a, it was a coup. You took over. No, no, no. He was still part of the thing. He was always sort of, you might say, outvoted because n- nobody was leftist in the GA, in our GA circle by then except him. Mm-hmm. So he, he stormed off and quit, but nobody threw him out. I remember saying, hey, you don't have to leave. You may be in the minority here in terms of thinking, but nobody's kicking you out. And then, then he went around forever for some years. Now he's kind of, he's a friend of mine, I guess you'd say now, but yeah, he was constantly bad mouthing us for that. That's not at all the way it happened though. Wow. Yeah. So uh, I guess that's, that's just interesting because green anarchy, I mean, like I said, for my zine and for other people, I mean, it's just so important, you know? Yeah. And so how, what was the importance of green anarchy magazine for you? How did it help you? develop your ideas because i think we all know when you write something you put it out there and people either agree with it or disagree with it it forces you to engage with your own ideas you're not a you know you're not just thinking to yourself so what was the importance and what did you learn from your time with green anarchy well that dialogue is always the challenge you know we all want to think we're we're open we we want to grow in our thoughts and uh, otherwise you know and mm-hmm. and uh i think it's not always easy you know you you don't want to be guilty of ideology formation or, you know, becoming an ideologue, but you know, that's always a danger. It just is, you know, and if you, you feel like wherever you're at, is you know, <laughs> probably a pretty sound position, you know, you want to defend it. You want to, you know, have some good arguments with people, but you know, where do you draw the line? I mean, we had trouble with that at times, you know, like disputes with people, you know, if you, like the old saying goes, if you have a printing press, then you're the one who has the freedom of the press, right? Well, if you do a magazine, if you're the editor, editors, you get to have the last word. So that was always tempting to just put something in 
<laughs> I was probably more guilty of it than anyone. Some article that we wanted to have it out there, but we didn't agree with it. So maybe it's better not to put in your editorial comment, but uh, I was not always uh, <laughs> respecting that. I would write something and pour mm -hmm. shit on it if I if I thought it was lousy. And I probably should have just waited and let mm -hmm. people decide, you know, without uh, the thumb on the scale, so to speak. But, you know, these are questions you have to sort of, you know, navigate. You have to just try to figure out the best way forward. And there were disputes even among our group. I mean, I would say of, of what I think of as the core four people, two were, and they're very good friends of mine, by the way, were a little less anti-left and two of us were more, <laughs> more anti-left, more strident about that, you know? So, uh, you know, we were always having good fights about stuff. Mm -hmm. Very cool. I appreciate that. That history is just so, so interesting to me just because I looked at a journal that, I mean, when people say primitivism, oh, it's, it was never relevant. What? I mean, you know, being in the news, the, like you said, the Eugene or anarchists, right? Like that was big stuff. And then like green anarchy being as you know big as it was in terms of circulation, this idea that green anarchy or anarcho primitivism was never relevant or that it's just this dead end is, I mean, that's a store that like, you're lying to yourself if you believe that. You know, so I think Green Anarchy is just so cool. Well, yeah, it was. I mean, it might have been that way. I mean, it was just a hell of a pleasant surprise. I was one of the people that probably had more of a hand in the money part of it, you know, trying to pull it together with the needed funds. And I remember thinking we had gotten to the point where it was $3,000 to print each issue, it was $3,000 to mail each issue. And I thought to myself, what the hell are we doing? We don't have any money. Where is this money coming from? So right then I knew it was coming in. People wanted the damn thing. And, uh, you know, so, hey, something that, that means it's being supported. You know, it was getting around and, and free to prisoners. That, there was a great big chunk of it that went to prisoners. A lot of prisoners wanted it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there it was. Very cool. We know that civilization has developed independently across the world. Looking at this development from where we are now, it appears that regardless of how historical events could have unfolded, the tendency is always towards further domestication. Every revolution has worked to accelerate this tendency. In that sense, it seems impossible to imagine humanity could follow any other path since civilization appeared. Would you say that civilization or domestication is comparable to a natural force such as gravity or plate tectonics, which is basically impossible to withstand uh, with human power? Or in other words, do you view civilization as something that must resolve itself through the historical process of growth and collapse as opposed to like individual human efforts? Well, I, I try to keep in mind uh, one of the central things or themes of Freddie Perlman, for example, against history, against Leviathan, all through that book, for example, he points out there's always been resistance to Leviathan. There's always been people fighting against it. Uh, we know that the tide has been running the wrong way, that with even with resistance, uh, we know who's, who's been winning and what's been happening to non-domesticated people on this planet but uh you know but the struggle goes on and he's uh it's it's salutary to to keep that in mind too you know that uh, the fight ain't over and so that's uh i mean there's all kinds of grounds for pessimism you know undoubtedly you've got to be rational about facing up to what's going down you know where where are we at where what are our strengths and uh prospects you know that sort of thing but uh but it you know as, as freddie pointed out it's uh it's always there and to kind of tie into that i i want to say for me personally um i would say since 2020 i've been dealing with a lot of apathy in terms of my radical politics since the energy from the george floyd uprising died down uh, I spent a lot of my time growing up in Minneapolis, and when that was happening, I was living in Phoenix. I really thought mm -hmm. that when that was happening, that there was no turning back, that, that the tide had shifted. 
um, especially in, in my home state in Minnesota, but seeing what was happening around the country and around the world, I thought that there was no turning back. Um, but since that time, since things have died down, gone back to the, the same normal that has been the problem forever, um, has made me very apathetic. I'm sure since you've been in the, the realm of radical politics, like you said, since the 60s, you've dealt with a lot of apathy. Um, how do you deal with that? Um, well, things come and go, you know, they ebb and they flow. And uh, if, if, especially if you're lucky enough to have been around for some of the more interesting times, you can use that. I mean, I always marvel at how younger, well, almost everybody's younger than me, of course, but, <laughs> you know, if you came of age in the 80s or something like that, man, uh, I had the luxury of, of, uh, ending up in California in the Bay Area, Berkeley, in the height of the 60s. And I went from Stanford to Haight-Ashbury uh, and so forth, you know, and, and that, uh, I guess I've always been temperamentally uh, oriented by that or inspired by that or something, or or even, you know, what I was, you know, in terms of the, the upsurge in the late 90s. And, and I remember Henry Kissinger, he was, you know, Dr. Strangelove, of course, but he was also a realist. And he said during the height of that, you know, these things were getting enormous from Seattle to Quebec City, Prague, Genoa, there were 300,000 people in the streets in Genoa. And the computers were flying out of the windows and the battle was raging. That was six months before 9-11, right? It was getting hot and heavy. And he said, I'm paraphrasing here, but he said, if that movement joins up with the uh, what's going on in the global south, the resistance there. If that ever connects, we're going to be in a world of hurt. <laughs> and fortunately for him, uh, the tide turned, you know, and then that kind of faded away. But he could see if it goes much further, this is really going to be on. You know, and so maybe the next time it really is going to be further on, much further down the road. I think people will see more easily with with more clarity what is really at stake and how fast it's going, how, how fast the whole technosphere and, and the, you know, eco-destruction and the mass shootings and everything else is getting worse by the minute. It doesn't take much to uh, grapple with that, or at least, you know, you get the anxiety from that, but got to have more than that. You got to be able to, uh, you know, connect the dots. So that means what? That means you got to get rid of this fucking death machine, which is civilization, before it kills off everything. Do you think we have enough time for these people to learn? Uh, or do you think that they're going to come to this conclusion on their own, like all of us have? Um, do you think it's something that's going to stare them in the face? Um, how do you think that that's going to go about well, you'd think so. You'd think so. But it's frustrating as hell. I mean, I, I wonder how much worse does it have to get before you start questioning things instead of fucking worrying about Trump every five minutes or you know, <laughs> bullshit like that. It's, uh oh, you know, Biden fell down the stairs again, everybody. Yeah. That's, 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 <laughs> so who knows? You know, who knows? It's it just keep getting worse. Uh, people will get more drugged out or, you know, it, there's certainly no guarantee. It might just keep getting worse until it's, it is past the point of no return. But I tend to think there is going to be, there's something going on. I think right now I'm getting this from quite a few people and I'm, I've been guilty of being too hopeful. I admit it, but I think something is brewing and maybe we're going to see uh, more of a wake up sooner than later. I don't know. It's actually my note. I had a note. I was going to say you're you're known as the optimist. I think a little bit, um, you know, because on your show again, on AVT Radio, one of the first things whenever you interview someone, you always say, "What do you see right now? What do What are you hoping for? What do you notice?" And so I want to ask, what What energy are there? Energies that specifically come to mind? Things that you see? Maybe there's things you don't want to talk about because you know confidentiality. Yada yada yada. Yeah, um, don't incriminate anybody. Are you? <laughs> are you are are you in this moment optimistic about anything? Well, I, maybe I could just put it this way: I, I don't, I don't want to slam the door on possibility. I don't want to rule it out. There are all too many people doing that, you know, and not, not just uh, 
this month or something. That's been going on a little while too. People just throw in the towel. Well, you're stupid if you think we can do anything about it. You know, well, why do that? Why, why slam the door on possibility? You don't know what's going to happen. And I always go back. One thing I go back to is the movement of the '60s, and I do not want to live in the past. I'm not interested in in that very much. You know, really at all. But that came out of nowhere. That global, mm-hmm. the movement of the '60s, whatever you want to call it. It just, it took off fairly suddenly all over the world. Nobody saw that coming. The Marxists waiting for the economic crisis, there was no economic crisis. It was a movement of relative expansion. The economy, relatively speaking, was doing fine. You know, relatively speaking, leaving out large groups of people, of course, but yeah, there was no economic crisis. And yet, you know, it's... Wow, who saw that coming? Nobody. It was a convergence of so many different disparate energies. I guess I'm still very interested in in this topic um, because I would say being all of us are members of Gen Z and I would say that there is a lot of nihilism, there is a lot of pessimism, uh, just generally in the general population, but especially so in radical politics and uh, radical green politics. If there's something that you could tell people like us from your time since the 60s, for those of us who feel like we have lost hope, I will admit I am one of those people who I I believe that there isn't much that we can do. I try not to be pessimistic, but I feel like it's it's been wired into my brain because of everything that I've seen since I've been growing up. Uh, What would you tell people like me in terms of uh, why we should keep our hope? Well, maybe one thing. uh, It seems to me there is... uh a revulsion against the technology. And I've, I've talked to some students about this uh, here, for example, and we, we had the same experience. This is like uh, cell phone addiction, you know, smartphone addiction uh, mm-hmm. and other forms of this. Same reaction. This is empty. It's time wasting. I realize that it's just scrolling is my life and it's so stupid. It's just uh, what a waste of time. And the second thing always followed, but I am addicted. I am hooked. I know it's a desolate bullshit thing, but here I am. So you got the two things. There's the understanding, but there's not any break. And but there are signs of that. You know, there's some some. There's this group here, quit social media. It's a club at the University of Oregon, or that uh, the uh, uh, the Luddite Club in Brooklyn, the kids there, uh, you know, anti cell phone use, basically, uh, and possibly more than that. But, uh, you know, some signs, and you've all, always, and maybe this has fallen off a little bit, but the uh, detox thing, especially in summertime, the camps where kids go and they don't have any devices, <laughs> why would people do that? I mean, what's, gee, isn't that the most wonderful thing on earth to, to have all this technology? I, no, it's like a disease. You need to you need to go <laughs> quarantine from that. So it's not like people mm-hmm. really love it. And the ads, I think, are so preposterous. I wonder how anyone cannot see the blatant bullshit involved. Like the connection, it's all about connection. We are connecting, every, connecting, connecting. We've never been so disconnected. There's never been so much isolation and loneliness. You, you. There's a hundred studies a day you can read about that or articles or testimonies. Everybody has that. That's the condition of this horrific uh, uh, techno zone that we're all in. We're all in, we're, we're all either forced, to, well, we're forced to. You can't have a job without a cell phone, right? So where's the freedom of choice? Yeah. You know, I, in other words, I guess I'm a little hopeful in the sense that it isn't that everybody believes in the shit. They don't. You know, they just don't. But yet, yet, what is happening? Not much. Okay, so, but at least there's the disaffection. Do you think that uh, that disconnection is by design? Or do you think that it's just the natural progression of the the way that our society is structured? Oh, yeah, it's, it's built in. It's built in, like the, you know, uh, Bowling Alone, that Putnam book that came out in, what, the 90s already? 
you know, the breakdown of all these communal ties or clubs or fellowships or, you know, uh, civic groups or bowling leagues or whatever. People are just more and more isolated as the technology, you know, takes over more and more and more. So, you know, people are just left sitting there alone, staring at the screen, the little screen or the big screen, one screen or another screen, and, and that's fucking life. If people are going to put up with that forever, well, then they are, and then we're fucked. But uh, I don't see a rosy future for that. It's just too toxic and empty and, uh, yeah. you know, unsatisfying, unhealthy. I mean, as I've talked about with my classroom, you know, and I wrote about it in Oak, number five, and I've talked about it on your show, John, it just, like, seeing my kids, or my, you know, or my students, I call them my kids, it just, like, they are, they seem so, like, lost. Like, when I, we did a uh, unit on media bias, it works, first of all, this idea that students, because they're raised around technology, this idea of the digital native, that kids are raised, therefore they should understand it, is a load of shit. I hate it. And it's it's negligent because it believes students, students are built to learn through technology. No, studies show technology, at best, doesn't facilitate learning, and at worst, hampers it. Big fucking surprise. Um... But like we did the media bias unit and part of it was well, how much phone use do you have? Most phones today, they have an option. It tracks what your screen time is. Um, my screen time is about three to four hours a day. Most of it is like podcast or project related, just the nature of it. But then I have kids saying six, seven, eight, nine, ten hours. And I'm like, holy shit, that's your whole day. And some of them were like, oh, only two hours. I'm like, that's cool. What do you do? They're like, oh, I go set my computer. I'm like, oh, 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 okay. Uh, well, you know, and I'm like, what sports are you doing? And, or, or what clubs are you involved in? And there just aren't any. Like the ones that are in sports, it's, I mean, yeah, they're off their phone during sport time. But then as soon as they're done, they're on it, you know? Um, and it's just, it, I mean, it depresses me seeing it because I was like, was this what my teachers saw me like when I was in high school? Because I was pretty bad before I came around to primitivism. And I still struggle, which is I think a lot of primitivists that are younger, like I grew up around it. I'm addicted and I'm anti-tech, but I can't get off of it, which I think in our case is harder because you know it's there and why it's bad, but you're still stuck in it. Like primitivism, it's not like a religion where it's like solves your problems, right? We still have to struggle because we're all still people born into this context and it's it's hard for me to see it but then you know the luddite club and hearing you talk about that and was the quit social media was that the guy that called your show that one time yeah dad's hearing dad's talk about it was was awesome and i i appreciated him knowing that people that are i mean i'm only 24 right so the age between the difference between me college age kids and those in high school is really not that different i was born in 99 it's just hard, but then you also realize it's because the have you heard of the term iPad generation? It's the idea that kids, particularly 2000, would you guys say like 2005 on is like these kids are raised on iPads? I would say it's even later than that. I would say uh, probably about 20, 2012 to 2015. True. Like, yeah, around that time, you know, when you're in a restaurant, you just see a kid with an iPad or a phone in front of them and the parents don't even acknowledge them because it's a way to just shut the kid up because they don't want a parent. Wow. Yeah. You know? And so what does that do to a kid? We know, like, Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs. Um, oh, now I'm blanking all the other names. But Steve Jobs, right? Um, he was, I'm never letting my kids have an iPad. I mean, he's the one that helped design it, and he doesn't want his kids to have it. I mean, shouldn't that tell you something about why you shouldn't let your kids have them? Yeah, I guess he's not the only one. I placed a tech guy who uh, knows how poisonous the thing is. It's like the classic drug dealer. Don't get high on your own supply. Wow, yeah. They, they, they acknowledge it for themselves and for their families, but they, they push it on everybody else. I'm very concerned for how these children are going to turn out. Mm -hmm. Right. I feel, like it, I, feel like it's, I feel like it's very comparable to how uh, the effect of drugs mm -hmm. on a developing brain versus these artificial connections. I feel like even more so than our current generation of Gen Z, but these toddlers right now are going to be even less socially capable yeah and, and we see it's a large enough problem in in our generation with people not understanding how to have social connection outside of uh, outside of their screens or the internet or even work um so i i agree with emmanuel completely that i think we 
are going to see a lot of things happening in the next 10 to 15 years, and I, I don't know how well it's going to go. Well, that, this got really fucking dark, really cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it makes you wonder. I mean, I, I did a lot of childcare in the 80s here in Eugene when I moved back here, and uh, spent a lot of time with one boy in particular, uh, single parent uh, deal. Uh, Video games, this was before uh, cell phones, you know, but I uh, couldn't get him to do anything. He was glued to the video game thing. And his mother wanted him to play soccer. So they took him to soccer and he would almost immediately fake an injury. So he'd have to come off the field and anything to, you know, he wanted to just do the video games nonstop. And it was so frustrating. Because he was a healthy kid, you know, and bright enough and everything. And But anyway, my point is, one day he put the video game down, never touched it again. Mm. Never. Then he got into, I was in the in the weight room in those days, still am. But anyway, he, he, got, he got interested in that. Became kind of a jock, a very successful young athletic kid. Really, really something like the opposite of a you know, spindly couch potato kid who didn't want to do anything. So, but I know that's harder to see today, though. It wasn't so immersive back then, mm -hmm. you know, far from it. Mm -hmm. You know, even though it's already the 80s, that that was just barely uh, laptop kind of stuff. You know, the personal computer mm -hmm. just started, that started mm -hmm. in the early 80s. You know, that was, that was new then. So, I mean, this wasn't much along the path from then and of course it totally took off later as we well know oh absolutely now every child in their pocket has more computing technology than what was required to send the first rocket to the moon incredible so we can see how things have changed so much just in the last 40 years i mean what is that i was just talking to jason rogers the other day and we were on the phone and she said, you know, like, think about it and it came out a couple of years ago like millennials and gen z we don't have hobbies what is, I mean, people say, what do you do for fun? Oh, I watch Netflix. I watch TikTok. It's like, no, like, what do you do? What are you doing with this? You are, it's kind of the whole, you know, situationist. It's life has become representation and consumption, right? It becomes the commodity form. And I think social media and, and TV streaming have be, are, are like one of the higher representations of that. Would you agree? I'm not as situationist educated as you are. Would you kind of agree with that? Well, yeah, I mean, and you could take it even further because historically in industrial society, it's future, which I understand it was actually written in the 70s, you know, toward the beginning of that, he's talking about hobbies as surrogate activities, mm -hmm. that people need hobbies because they don't have any real substance or freedom in their lives, so they have to resort to hobbies. Now, as you just said, uh, don't even get the hobbies. I mean, there's no room for hobbies even. So a further step of estrangement, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And so I guess I want to return a little bit back, and we only have a couple questions left. Returning kind of to the – we haven't talked so much of the theory of primitivism so much, but I've been reading a book called Inside the Neolithic Mind by Williams and Pierce. Are you perhaps familiar with that book? I'm not, no. Okay, so it kind of explores the relationship. And they get a little weird with it. Like they think like – the, the cosmology of all these different cultures, regardless of where they are, are kind of rooted in neurology and how the brain is structured. It's very interesting. But they have this idea that basically the root of domestication and oppression, shamanism, ritual, it, it, well, it all goes back to ritual. And that's something you've talked about early on, is this idea like the shaman who wanted to prevent, show how great their power over there was over nature was, oh, I want the auroch and I need this animal, I need this animal. And the more and more animals, well, if you have a thousand goats and so does the other guy, it doesn't seem as cool. So now you need to tame the auroch, right? Because now that's a powerful animal and you're building structures to honor the animals. So it's interesting to me that like your idea also of time and how everyone now is like, oh, we don't have time for anything. You've kind of been talking about this idea since like, I don't know, really like the 80s and 90s, right? Like that's where you're writing and people are starting to come around to a lot of that. And so it's interesting. But really, the, the root of everything, at least in at least in what's called, you know, the Fertile Crescent, and partially they the kind of argue the uh, Western Europe is rooted in religion. And so I find that interesting. Do you have you 
has your conception of the, the notion of origins, which I know is important in why you dismiss postmodernism, have your ideas radically changed in that regard? Or are you less interested in the minute details, but more so the larger picture? Well, you know, I was thinking about uh, Sasha Engel's work, uh, as I see it anyway, has a place in this kind of discussion. In other words, how do you get to the domestication? What uh, What kind of thinking or practices uh, leads up to that you know that's one way to put it anyway and I, my emphasis is more on the you know most basic social institutions starting with divisional labor for example but uh, he's looking at it more you know he talks about iteration and repetition and how even gestures can become somewhat reified or predictable or uh you know, leading on to language forms, which which by nature are repetitive. You know, we use the same letters and the same words in whatever language, but uh, how that's the deeply domesticating thing before you get to any plants or animals, uh, as I understand it anyway. Uh, yeah, and I find that uh, really interesting. Kind of a more abstract. Uh, way of looking at it than I have, I guess, but uh, maybe a, a real step forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just, as you know, we just had Sasha on the episode. So if anyone wants to listen to that, this should be, it should be Sasha's episode than this one in order of upload if nothing goes in between. But I highly recommend listening to that as well as uh, reading Plant Anarchy or any of the other work Sasha's done. Because I'd say he's breaking a lot of new ground in terms of like the notion of origins and so to speak, where it all went wrong. So. Yeah, I, yeah, I too want to recommend the uh, the the latest thing, the uh, your podcast with him. I found that really helpful. I appreciate that. Did you two have any other questions? Because I've been kind of dominating it recently. You got any? Um, I I feel like that a lot of my questions have been answered. I do see that we have one more though that uh, we've got on our list, so I will ask it. Where is primitivism and anarchism going? What advice do you have for those seeking resistance? Oh, I think we can help the thing along, you know, as as civilization or late civilization, if we want to call it that, presents itself ever more starkly, ever more clearly, uh, you know, hard to uh, avoid what we're seeing, you know, and uh, the, the fruits of it. Um, I think we can help that along, you know, help deepen that picture. Uh, this doesn't happen by accident. This is not some coincidence. There's a, there's quite a trajectory and a logic and an inner logic to it, uh, to domestication, which is, you know, at the heart of civilization, and it just keeps increasing. The control is all about control. It was from the start, and it is right now, trying to increase its control. And uh, what what does that leave us with? And uh, you know. How can you avoid the rejection? You know, how can you not come to a conclusion that, well, uh, in my mind, fairly unavoidable? You've you've got to get rid of it. It's it's so fundamental. That, and uh, you know, tying these things together isn't hard to do, I think. But of course, access is <laughs> is hard to do. You know, we struggle with. Uh, We've got some really outstanding publications and podcasts now, but uh, you know, you routinely kept out of the picture. I mean, I thought uh, you know the death of Kaczynski, what two weeks ago or whenever it was, was there would be an upsurge, you know, like the question, well, was he right? You know, the so-called manifesto of is that relevant or no? There was almost nothing and. Uh, you know, I'm not saying this is a big conspiracy or something, but, you know, it's not, quote, respectable. It's not uh, it's not the latest gossip about Trump or, you know, that's not part of the picture. So that's the giant obstacle. And we got to try to tackle that on a sort of practical basis somehow, you know, to, to change that. To introduce these things into the conversation uh, with society. I don't know what's going to happen, though. I mean, I just, I don't have any... There's no easy answer in my view. To uh, kind of 
end things off on a light note, I just want to say, it sounds like Emmanuel might have one more question for you, uh, but talking about Kaczynski and yourself, I just want to let you know that in Phoenix, Arizona, in 2019, I was kicked out of an Extinction Rebellion event for handing out printed off copies of your essays and industrial <laughs> society in its future. They didn't yeah. appreciate that from me at all. They, they called the police on me and they ex escorted me out of their event. Jeez. Oh, wow. I remember that. That was funny. I yeah. didn't believe you when you called me like I was handing out printed, uh, anti-civ material and they didn't, they didn't like that. And of course, leave it to the leftist to call the police on people they don't like. I mean, that's so fucking typical. Yeah. <laughs> Truly. All right. So my question was, Anarchism tends to be very secular historically. Do you think there's any value in constructing, not necessarily constructing, that sounds very artificial, but creating a new, some new form of spirituality for people when it comes to how we interact with our environment? Well, a pleasant surprise uh, to me uh, continues to occur, and that is uh, I was talking just a very few days ago from a 20-something uh, uh, kid from uh, Pittsburgh, and we were sort of talking about uh, latest forms in writing, or you know, what is do you have a different style or take or something like that? And I guess I was saying something about how I think I've gotten more spiritual, for want of a better word, in some of my later latest writings, and uh, and I was wondering. Is he going to kind of, you know, turn up his nose at that? He was down. And this is a heavy duty, you know, in punk bands and, you know, just look like a, you know, very good, typical black box sort of anarchist guy. He was delighted to hear that. So we didn't, we didn't have too much chance to try to flesh that out a little bit more. But, uh, you know, you, you find that I was very hesitant to kind of explore that or to think about that more because I thought, well, that's not going to go over. That's, uh, you know, the whole past history of anarchism, especially in the 19th century, I suppose, was very materialist in a wooden sort of a way. And, you know, you don't yeah. you don't bring up that kind of stuff. Uh, well, that's not so much the case, and we shouldn't be afraid of uh, going there, in my view. It seems to me that if we are trying to rewild in some way and rediscover the sort of mindset that our very distant ancestors had, then that would involve a reanimation of the world and an abandonment of this purely materialistic mindset, which I believe is a direct, um, a direct philosophical development that leads to the exploitation of lands. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I mean, I would even say, like, your piece in, uh, in Plastic Neuter, I keep self-plugging, I swear it's not on purpose, uh, a lot of people really, really liked it. And you said, you know, you've been writing in a kind of more spiritual form. Um, and I would say your work, your piece Poverty was awesome. And our editor actually said, I read the Steve and Zerzan parts and I'm really into it. I like bridging the gap between religion and primitive life in general. If a part of being primitive is being, quote, simple and easier, it should seem that spirituality comes easier, too, for those partaking in it. And so far as transcendence and stuff like that is a lot more realistic than it may be for people in an artificial world. So this idea of realizing that there is a – and you used the term Aboriginal wholeness before, or wholeness or anything like that, the sense of the unity – yeah, like the the sub the notion of subject and object should dissipate in a sort of spiritual sense, right? Like we should feel a sense of unity with the world around us, whether you call that animism in an anthropological sense or not. Like I consider myself secular, but I, as I say to people, I live as if animism is true, right? Oh, you know, lovely. And so I think like that's so important. And you know, some people are like, oh, that's just willy nilly. You're just LARPing, right, as a hunter-gatherer, it's like, well, yeah, because I want to be one. <laughs> right? <laughs> Maybe they were on to something, but that's just me. Well, yeah, and there's the anti-work part of it, too. I remember, uh, I think it's the last line of uh, News from Nowhere that, uh, I think that's a very wonderful book by Morris, you know, and he he's sort of projecting or predicting, hoping for, how does he put it, a, a time of rest time of fellowship i think is the word he uses oh there there you go you know mm -hmm. why work why why not be at ease in the unbuilt world you know the, 
you know, that intimacy, that communion with uh, with the original world. Yeah, I actually just got a copy of Never Work, which I didn't realize, but you're in it with Taylorism and Unionism. I think is the essay name. I just got it in the mail today. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That that piece that's kind of a stretch. <laughs> it's not it's not fundamentally anti-work, but it's you know it's a little historical study. Yeah, so it's by. I always forget how you say it. Is it Detritus Books? I always forget how you say their name. I always say Detritus, but I could be wrong. Oh, yeah, Detritus. But yeah, I just got that in the mail from Abraxas, who ordered uh, copies of the zine. I'm self plugging again. Oh, no. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I think. I I think that's about all we have for you, John. We we really do appreciate you stopping by as people who have all read your works for many years. Being able to finally talk to you is very interesting, especially as anarchists. We really don't get a chance to speak to people who have had such a large impact on our political development and our radicalization. Uh, so it's been really nice to speak to you, and we really do appreciate you stopping by to talk to little old us. Uh, little old me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much i've really mm -hmm. enjoyed the dialogue of course of course and do you have any theory or book recommendations and where can people find you and support your work uh well go to the radio show i i had this past week off because uh, my sound guy carl was out of town but i'm gonna jump back on it uh tuesday night uh on kwva.org K oh kwvaradio.org if you just go to KWVA, you get the Korean War Veterans Organization. <laughs> <laughs> we'll link it. both. How about that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for stopping by, and um, hopefully we'll get to talk to you again sometime in the future. That would be great. I'd appreciate it. Of course.